what we're going to be talking about is the dehumidification process. It's really been developed uh, for dehumidifying air for heating and cooling purposes. There certainly can be other applications of it as I mean, anytime you need to remove moisture from air, it will be able to do it uh, at much more efficiently than, uh, than the, let's say traditional condensation processes at least. And there, there are certainly some intriguing possibilities, I think. But I'm going to look at this from the perspective of you know, the development that we have done. Here I've listed uh, key uh, collaborators and want to note that we've been supported by DOE, ARPA E, uh, Department of Defense and the Navy, and that the technologies we're talking about are covered by seven issued US patents and 20 international patents. Um, basic system is one where we take humid air and we pass it through what's not a whole I mean, conceptually, you could imagine it going through a bunch of uh, uh, air handler plates, except that these plates are membrane covered and have uh, in areas in the middle that are essentially evacuated. So they simply suck the moisture out of the air without condensing it. Uh, it comes out as water vapor. Uh, we then pass it through <clears throat> a compressor. And I use the term advisedly because we're talking about compressor that's operating in the range of, uh, of a hundredth of an atmosphere inlet pressures absolute to uh, outlet pressures of uh, five to ten hundred, hundredths of an atmosphere, five, uh, you know, 0.05 to 0 0.1 atmospheres. Then uh, from there, one can condense it using uh, standard condensing technology. Uh, since there's some leakage in the membrane, why we have a vacuum pump that has to be used to remove any air leakage, but we condense the water and then it can go back up, be taken up to atmospheric pressure very efficiently. Um, the membrane that we're currently using is a zeolite membrane developed at Pacific Northwest National Lab. <clears throat> and uh, it basically is a membrane that's about two microns thick, supported mechanically by a porous metal substrate that's about 50 microns thick. And the pores in the zeolite membrane are on the order of 0.35 nanometers. So they're uh, they basically uh, act as a very effective filter in the sense that uh, dust particles and things like that are not going to go through it. So that fundamentally the moisture that comes out is very clean. Uh, if you look at it conceptually, uh, we have membrane coatings on the outside of this rectangular object here. Uh, the inside is where uh, the moisture is removed then. And typically for the case we're looking at here, if we had uh, 75 degree Fahrenheit air blowing past it that was saturated and blowing past it the other side, uh, coming at 50% RHY, we would have uh, vacuum of about 0.15 PSI uh, absolute uh, uh, that would be removing the moisture. And I state that, I mean, the, the process works in the sense that the air can be moving at speeds of typical of what they do in typical air conditioning systems and uh, four to eight inches of uh, membrane passing past four to eight inches of membrane is capable of removing uh, half of the moisture in the air. Um, if we look at the ideal system, well, of course, we'll have an ideal membrane, uh, so we won't have any air leakage. It goes through the vapor compressor. We uh, then condense it. We uh, have a water pump and our uh, pump that up to atmospheric conditions and come out with uh, pure liquid water. Um, the um, the compression energy required basically for an ideal uh, compressor would be an RT logarithm of the pressure ratios. Uh, the interesting thing is that the pumping energy is more like a thousandth of the compressor energy uh, that would be required if we were to try and come. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and hence, uh, it is far more efficient to condense the liquid than it would be to pump the uh, vapor up to atmospheric conditions. Uh, to give a quick comparison with uh, condensation processes, what I've shown here is saying if we had a Carnot system 
nose taking air at 94 degrees Fahrenheit, 52% RH, and then removing anywhere from 5 to 25% relative humidity and going through it, uh, the Carnot system at 5% removal would basically require about 15 kilowatts. A membrane system doing the same thing would require about four kilowatts. Uh, as we remove more moisture, why the uh, membrane advantage and the ratio becomes less, but of course the kilowatt difference becomes larger because if we get up to 25%, why we're looking at something like uh, 50 kilowatts for the membrane and a little over 100 kilowatts for the uh, uh, Carnot system. Um, there are a number of things that uh, affect uh, system efficiency, the membrane size and the water permeance. Membrane air leakage is a major factor. If we look at the water permeance of the available membranes, it really is quite good at this point. And so we fundamentally don't need more uh, higher permeance membranes from the water standpoint. Uh, air leakage, uh, we have the membranes are I would say quite good, but there's room for substantial improvement uh, relative to the ones that can be, shall we say, routinely made. A uh, non-ideal compressor and vacuum pump is another factor. We'll talk about that a bit more later and show some specific uh, on that. Non-ideal condensers, just as you have non-ideal condensers in traditional air conditioners, why that, that uh, degrade performance it does in this system as well. Uh, your condenser pump and fan is an energy input and hence reduces your total efficiency. Air pressure drop in the membrane module uh, requires energy as well. Although fundamentally, uh, it's not a whole lot different than the heat transfer uh, in a typical air handler. And so uh, here you're fundamentally uh, using exchanging your membrane module and passing the air through it where you're directly drying it uh, instead of having an air handler in a typical liquid shower. Uh, just to look at the impact of air permeance, the bottom line there, P equal to 10 to the minus 9, is basically where membranes are pretty much at this point. And so you can see that while uh, if you had a, something that was ideal, this plot is saying if the system is ideal, except that uh, it doesn't have an ideal membrane, why you could have COPs in the range of 10 to 15 with existing membranes. Uh, but the uh, key thing is that by improving uh, that air leakage by two orders of magnitude, which has been done in laboratory size samples, uh, why you can look at some tremendous improvements in uh, in, in system efficiency. And once you get up to the 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 12 area, why we're not really a, that far away from the ideal performance of the system. So fundamentally, if in terms of development needs for this, why if one could get where we had membrane production with air permeance in the order of 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 12 a mole APA per square meter per second, that would be a major advance for us. Uh, low cost, uh, large scale production is certainly needed. And at this point with the zeolite membrane, the, the uh, mechanical substrate is uh, a porous nickel substrate. And so while the cost uh, ultimately, just in terms of the nickel cost is on the order of uh, $50 per uh, ton of dehumidification, refrigeration ton of dehumidification capacity, why that is a significant element. And I am sure that a lower cost substrate could be found eventually. Um, compressor and vacuum pump. Uh, if we're showing here what you'd have with an ideal system, ideal membranes and everything. Uh, so that ideal line is up there. If you had an isentropic efficiency of 65%, why it's phase fundamentally 65% of that COP. Right now, the very best, there's a single production compressor that we're aware of that is roughly in the right range of uh, uh, compressing water vapor, and it's in limited production, and it appears to have an isentropic efficiency of about 65% for large systems. Uh, we're not aware of anything that's suitable for small systems uh, that uh, comes anywhere close to that. So this is, is another area where uh, 
having some significant development on uh, uh, small scale uh, production compressors uh, and uh, additional development certainly for the larger scale compressors would be very good. Uh, where things stand now, we have shown them it works very well in the laboratory, laboratory prototype. We have sort of a half refrigeration ton uh, prototype that is operated uh, in scaling up from the lab prototype. Why uh, we had some problems with the uh, membrane support. We've fixed that, but we don't have enough good membrane at this point to actually go ahead and redo it. Uh, and uh, so that uh, is, is something where uh, it, it has a way to go, but uh, clearly the physics works and the system works, and uh, we're confident that it can uh, move forward. Uh, if we were to take the best available technology right now uh, that, and get it into a system with the membrane leaks fixed, why we would have something along this uh, MMAC 2020 line in terms of comparison, comparing what uh, the uh, energy use would be compared to a half kilowatt per ton chiller doing the same, uh, performing the same dehumidification. Uh, with the improved membranes and hopefully improved compressors over the next few years, why the, the line could drop to the green line down here. Uh, so there's potential for far more efficient dehumidification than we have right now. Uh, and so, I just simply like to conclude and say that we feel it has excellent potential for removing moisture from moist air flows from room temperature to higher temperatures at very high efficiency. Leak-free membranes, low-cost membrane production, and efficient compressors are uh, a major development need at this point. And so with that, I, that's, that's what I have to say today. I'll be able, glad to answer questions later on.